morning, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining. Uh, this is a really great honor to have uh, two people who need no introduction, Dr. Dr. Satyan Lakshmi and Dr. Steve Atman, to speak about nitric oxide. Um, my name is Julie Ui, and online with me um, looking after this event is Rahul, our fellow. Uh, just on the screen here is our um, um, social media page. All these, um, the recordings with Dr. Edmonds and Dr. Lashmi's permission will be uploaded to our UNSW school website in due course, and I shall post it on the um, WhatsApp, WeChat, Telegram um, uh, platforms when they're available, with their permission, of course. So, um, Ooh, just some housekeeping rules. We're going to mute everyone. Not sure how many people will join, so don't be insulted. Um, we hope to leave about 10 to 15 minutes at the end for Q&A, but uh, if you have real burning questions, uh, just type it in the chat pane or raise your hand. Um, we won't interrupt the speakers while they're speaking. Um, and uh, again, the talks will be uploaded. So if it's not in your time zone, you can access it um, whenever you're awake. So a brief um, introduction to our two esteemed speakers. Uh, everyone knows them, so I probably don't have to tell you who they are. I nicked their pictures from the web, but they're online now, as you can see, looking very glamorous and uh, in daylight. So first off, we've got Dr. Satyan Lakshmi from UC Davis in California. Uh, and then follow that with Dr. Steve Atman, uh, who's uh, he's president-elect of the APS. Congratulations. I didn't know that. Okay, we need an on-site uh, pass soon, Steve. Um, and he's from, as you know, Children's Hospital in Colorado, uh, USA. So without further ado, I shall pass it on first to Dr. Satyan. Um, and um, over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Judy. Thank you for the kind introduction. I believe Steve is already the president, right, Steve? Uh, this this year is my presidential year. Fantastic. Okay. I could claim to say I haven't been impeached yet, so we'll see. <laughs> that would be a first. <laughs> Thank you. I'll mute myself now. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you, Julie, for the kind introduction. It's a pleasure to share this platform with uh, my guru, Steve Abman. So thank you so much for this opportunity. So we both thought we will talk about inhaled nitric oxide in the NICU. And the title was given to us by Julie from the beginning and now the end. So Steve and I have no conflict of interest and we have been funded through NIH and the American Academy of Pediatrics. So let's talk about the beginning. Um, the nitroglycerin was invented by originally synthesized by Sobrero and was used by Alfred Nobel to manufacture dynamite. In 1960, 1860s, when all the factory workers were working with dynamite, they observed two very interesting phenomena. The first phenomenon was with healthy workers. These healthy workers noticed that when they used um, when they worked in those factories on Monday morning, when they came to work, they were starting to get headaches. And these headaches now we know was from nitroglycerin fumes that led to vasodilation causing headaches. So the healthy people suffered from headaches when they came to work on Mondays. I'll let you know. Should be on the other hand, people who were sick with coronary artery disease, when they were in the factory, they felt better because they were their chest pains were better due to nitroglycerin inhalation. But when they went home on weekends, when their wives had them do household chores, they were getting chest pains and they were not able to work because they were missing their nitroglycerin fumes. Let's fast forward to the 1980s and we are back in Dr. Furchgott's laboratory in Brooklyn, New York. And he had two technicians who were working with vessels in vessel baths. And what he noticed was that when the more meticulous technician took vessels and put them in these vessel baths, uh, as you can see down here, when the more meticulous technician did these dissections, when they used acetylcholine, they would see a significant relaxation of these vessels. On the other hand, when a new technician came along and did a bad job of dissecting these vessels, and destroyed the endothelium, 
then while adding acetylcholine, they did not see a relaxation of these vessels. And being an astute scientist, Dr. Furchgaard figured out that the difference between these two preparations was destruction of endothelium. And he called this factor as the endothelium derived relaxing factor or EDRF. Interestingly, RF were also his initials and I guess he used that name because of that reason. So now we know that in the endothelial cell, the enzyme ENOS, endothelial nitric oxide synthase, uses the substrates L-arginine to form nitric oxide. And for example, if you have an endothelium dependent vasodilator such as acetylcholine, that goes and stimulates ENOS in the endothelium to produce nitric oxide that traverses the gap between the endothelial cell and the smooth muscle cell and acts on soluble guanyl cyclase to produce cyclic GMP. And cyclic GMP reduces the ionic cytosolic concentration of calcium and then that leads to vasodilation. Cyclic GMP is broken down by PDE5, thereby limiting its activity inside the cell. So what we were seeing in Dr. Forsgaard's preparation was that if the endothelium was destroyed, acetylcholine was not having this relaxing effect. And so he called this substance endothelium derived relaxing factor. We also know that using an inhibitor such as L-nitroarginine to inhibit ENOS by competitively blocking L-arginine led to reduction in release of nitric oxide from the endothelial cell. And we'll come to this substance also known as LNA in the next couple of slides. So the three individuals who discovered and promoted endothelium delayed relaxing factor nitric oxide, uh, Robert Furchgaard, Louis Ignaro, and Farid Murad, the three of them received their Nobel Prize for discovery of nitric oxide in 19. 98. And I find this very interesting that Alfred Nobel started this phenomenon with dynamite and nitroglycerin. This led to nitroglycerin use both as sublingual tablets and patches for a long period of time before you knew anything about nitric oxide. Subsequently, we figured out endothelial derived relaxing factor and the three people get a Nobel Prize. I find this to be a very interesting cycle, starting off with Dr. No Pro Nobel and then ending with the Nobel Prize. So moving forward, we are all neonatologists and pulmonologists. So let's talk about the fetal lung. As many of you know, the fetal lung is filled with fluid and the pulmonary vessels supplying the fetus are constricted. So the fetus is in a state of physiologic pulmonary hypertension. Once the baby is born, air enters the alveolus and the PaO2 increases resulting in pulmonary vasodilation. If you look at LAM models, comparing fetal life to the first 30 minutes of postnatal life, there's a modest increase in PaO2, starting with around 20 to 25 in a fetal umbilical artery, up to approximately 45 to 50 millimeters of mercury PaO2 by around 30 minutes. And this small increase in PaO2, along with allular increase in P uppercase AO2, results in reduction in pulmonary arterial pressure over the same period of time as shown by the green line here, along with an increase in pulmonary blood flow and an increase in systemic arterial pressure. So during fetal life, the PA pressure is higher than the systemic arterial pressure. And at birth, these two lines crisscross so that the systemic arterial pressure remains high way above pulmonary arterial pressure in all healthy individuals for the rest of our lives, unless we develop pulmonary hypertension. So, uh, during this time, we were not really clear as to what exactly caused this pulmonary vasodilation. And uh, my co-presenter, Dr. Abman, in his lab, along with David Confield and others, devised a very interesting experiment where he took term gestation lamps and then infused these lamps with either LNA or without LNA. And LNA, as I mentioned earlier, is the inhibitor of nitric oxide synthase into the pulmonary artery of this fetus for 20 minutes before delivery and continued for 10 minutes of ventilation. And ventilation was conducted initially with 10% O2 so that the fetal PO2 would not change much and subsequently with 100% oxygen. What they noticed was really interesting. So in the lamps that got control, and the control lamps that did not receive LNA, there was a huge increase in pulmonary blood flow as was expected at birth and a further increase 
with administration of 100% O2. On the other hand, the lamps that received LNA through their pulmonary artery did not show any, an increase in uh, pulmonary blood flow, but did show an increase with 100% O2. This goes to show that the increase in pulmonary blood flow induced by ventilation was mediated through nitric oxide produced by the endothelium of these pulmonary arteries. This experiment, these two patterns of blood flow are very similar to what we see in normal transition. This is similar to the control lamps where you see an increase in pulmonary blood flow and lamps with and babies with PPHN where transition is abnormal and the fetal physiologic pulmonary hypertension persists during the postnatal life resulting in persistent pulmonary hypertension of the newborn. And this is similar to what you saw in these lamps that got LNA. We all know that PPHN leads to several changes in the cardiac uh, function, resulting in right ventricular hypertrophy and dilation, shifting of the interventricular septum towards the left, thereby compromising left ventricular preload, tricuspid regurgitation, and right to the left or bidirectional shunts at the oval foramen and also the ductus arteriosus. These are the hallmark features of PPHN in babies. Subsequently, John Kinsella, a close friend of Dr. Abman, he used inhaled nitric oxide in lamps and showed that the effect of inhaled nitric oxide was selective to pulmonary vasodilation. Here you see the pulmonary arterial pressure in black squares and aortic pressure in open squares. And you see that with the use of inhaled nitric oxide, there's a selective drop in pulmonary arterial pressure without a change in aortic pressure. And this is the so-called selective vasodilation that you see with inhaled nitric oxide. So why do you see selective vasodilation? That's because when inhaled nitric oxide enters the alveolus, we believe that it induces pulmonary vasodilation in the adjacent pulmonary vessels. But once the nitric oxide enters the blood system, it combines with hemoglobin to form methemoglobin and gets inactivated and we don't see any systemic vasodilation effects. Although more recently we are, reali we are realizing that nitric oxide does have effects on the systemic circulation as well in various ways. This is called as, this is called as the selective effect with effect limited to the pulmonary circulation. A second interesting phenomenon is the micro selective effect where nitric oxide only enters the ventilated alveolus but does not enter the non-ventilated alveolus thereby limiting vasodilation to this particular area, thereby enhancing ventilation perfusion matching. And this effect is known as the micro, so it should be selective, sorry, micro selective effect and is limited to the ventilated alveolus. For this reason, even in patients that do not have pulmonary hypertension, nitric oxide can show some increase in oxygenation and that's because it improves as ventilation perfusion matching in these, in these uh, individuals. Subsequently, several large randomized trials were done comparing placebo to inhaled nitric oxide. And here is one called as the NINO study, neonatal inhaled nitric oxide study, where they used inhaled nitric oxide along with placebo and showed that in patients with hypoxemic respiratory failure with significantly high oxygenation indices, the incidence of death or ECMO was significantly reduced from 64% to 46% with the use of nitric oxide. Interestingly, there was no difference in death and all this improvement was predominantly due to the reduction in the need for ECMO in these patients. In addition, it was shown that the use of inhaled nitric oxide resulted in a significant decrease in the alveolar arterial gradient with improvement in oxygenation compared to placebo. These and many other trials led to the approval by FDA in 1999 for use of inhaled nitric oxide in the management of patients with PPHN. And the current indication we have from the FDA is for treatment of term and near-term infants greater than 34 weeks of gestation with hypoxemic respiratory failure with either clinical or echocardiographic evidence of pulmonary hypertension, where we know that nitric oxide can improve oxygenation and reduces the need for ECMO. So this is the approval that was given in 1999. And to this day, that's the only indication for which nitric oxide is officially approved. So let's look at the various approved uses of inhaled nitric oxide. And to recapitulate all of them, it's PPHN or HRF in greater than 34 week gestation infants. The time when you use or initiate inhaled nitric oxide is slightly controversial. Um, 
most places use it when a number called oxygenation index, which is a measure of severity of hypoxemic respiratory failure when this number exceeds approximately 25. Although some other institutions, when you have echo evidence of PPHN, tend to use inhaled nitric oxide earlier at an oxygenation index of 15 or 20. Subsequently, uh, if you need more than 60% oxygen to maintain a preductal SAT of greater than 90%, then also many centers start using inhaled nitric oxide. A recent um, paper that came out with the European guidelines for management of pulmonary arterial disease stated that inhaled nitric oxide is indicated for PPHN in near-term infants and term infants to reduce their need for ECMO if the PAO2 is less than 100 millimeters of mercury while receiving 100% O2, and, uh, or if the OI exceeds 25. And this got high level of evidence rating by this organization. The initial dose is around 20 parts per million. People have used anywhere from five parts to 80 parts. 20 parts provides the optimal pulmonary vasodilation along with an increase in PAO2. And increasing the dose to 80 parts per million only enhances the response in a small selected group of individuals. So most of us initiate therapy with inhaled nitric oxide at 20 parts per million. There are a few conditions where we should exercise caution or we can almost say that uh, inhaled nitric oxide is contraindicated and these conditions include congenital diaphragmatic hernia, left ventricular dysfunction or hyperplastic left heart with ductal dependent systemic circulation and also where the baseline methemoglobin levels are high with methemoglobinemia. Let's briefly look at uh, left ventricular dysfunction. Here is an upside down heart with the ventricles being on the top and the atria being here at the bottom. If you have evidence of left ventricular dysfunction, these patients often have elevated left atrial pressure along with pulmonary venous hypertension. And in these situations, there is exist pre-existing pulmonary edema because of pulmonary venous hypertension. In, in this condition, it's often common to see left ventricular dysfunction in patients with asphyxia with or without whole body hypothermia, in patients with diaphragmatic hernia, and also patients with sepsis. In these instances, if you use inhaled nitric oxide, you increase flooding into the pulmonary circulation by opening up the arterial side, further exacerbating pulmonary edema and causing more problems. This is almost similar to having a uh, toilet which is blocked, and this blockage is the LV dysfunction. And in this case, when you use inhaled nitric oxide, it's almost like flushing the toilet, causing more and more pulmonary edema. As you can see in this graph that shows, this is a baby that we had in uh, Davis a couple of weeks back that had LV dysfunction that received inhaled nitric oxide. And you can see evidence of pulmonary edema in this patient, including a bit of pleural effusion on both sides. A more appropriate treatment here would be to use a plunger, which is Mildenone in this case. And Mildenone acts on the left ventricle and improves ventricular function and also happens to be an inodilator causing pulmonary arterial dilation, and this is thought to be a better drug in this particular condition. The second condition where we should be really cautious about using nitric oxide is any condition such as a hyperplastic left heart, which where the systemic circulation is dependent on the shunt across the ductus. Um, I have used, without having an echocardiogram during transport, I have used inhaled nitric oxide in a patient with hyperplastic left heart with disastrous consequences. So this happens in areas where access to echo is limited, especially during transport. So in this particular case, where there was a hyperplastic left heart with a hyperplastic narrow ascending aorta, there was a significant shunt across the ductus in the right to left direction, and this shunt maintained perfusion to the lower half of the body, and that's how this baby was having good perfusion. In this patient, once I administered inhaled nitric oxide to this patient, inhaled nitric oxide significantly dropped the pulmonary vascular resistance, thereby eliminating the left to right, right to left shunt across the ductus arteriosus, and thereby causing systemic oligemia and causing acidosis and anuria and renal failure. So inhaled nitric oxide drops pulmonary vascular resistance and eliminates the right to left shunt. And one, you get pulmonary edema as a consequence of this. And two, there's ischemia to systemic organs. And that's the reason why in ductal dependent systemic circulation in congenital heart disease, you should not use inhaled nitric oxide. 
And going back to the case with left ventricular dysfunction, uh, Patrick McNamara and Harish Kriplani and their colleagues in Toronto and uh, uh, London, Ontario have shown that the use of mildenone in patients who have not responded to inhaled nitric oxide can be quite effective with a significant drop in oxygenation index following the use of mildenone in these patients. So in selected patients who have not responded to inhaled nitric oxide and those with left ventricular dysfunction, intravenous mildenone can be an effective drug. Caution should be exercised because there were a couple of case reports where mildenone it was used and there was intraventricular hemorrhage observed in some patients. So it's good to obtain a head ultrasound at baseline before starting inhale intravenous mildenone. Moving forward, what can we do to enhance the effect of inhaled nitric oxide? Um, one thing to remember while managing PPHN is that getting a baseline x-ray and figuring out the lung pathology is really crucial to optimizing therapy. For example, if you have a condition where you have hyperplastic lungs, for example, congenital diaphragmatic hernia. In these patients, it's important to follow a lung protective strategy with low mean airway pressure and ventilating without causing volume trauma. On the other hand, when you have significant parenchymal lung disease, such as meconium aspiration syndrome or respiratory distress syndrome due to surfactant deficiency or pneumonia, in these areas, the strategy is for lung recruitment. And without optimally recruiting the lung, there is no benefit in administering inhaled nitric oxide. So in conditions with, with parenchymal lung disease, don't have PPOPhobia, use adequate PEEP and adequate mean airway pressure to open up the lung. On the other hand, when you have really small lungs, avoid volume trauma and use gentle ventilation. Even in patients with black lung PPHN without any parenchymal lung disease, and gentle ventilation appears to work much better than using very high mean airway pressure. Subsequently, once you optimize lung recruitment in these patients, then giving inhaled nitric oxide will have a much better effect. So the strategy for lung recruitment and surfactant is different when you have parenchymal disease and if you do not have parenchymal lung disease. So this was very clearly shown by John Kinsella and his colleagues. And as you can see in this graph, here the red bars indicate high frequency oscillatory ventilation, one mode of recruitment. The green bars indicate inhaled nitric oxide and the blue bars indicate patients that received both high frequency oscillatory ventilation and inhaled nitric oxide. You can see here that in patients with parenchymal lung disease with PPHN, such as meconium aspiration syndrome and RDS, the use of lung recruitment with high frequency oscillatory ventilation and inhaled nitric oxide do show an additive effect. On the other hand, when the disease is mainly vascular, such as primary PPHN without lung disease, the recruitment with high frequency oscillatory is not necessary as long as the lung is adequately open and inhaled nitric oxide is much more effective in this particular condition. And this, with this introduction, we move on to the use of surfactant because surfactant is one more way of opening up the lung more efficiently in patients with parenchymal lung disease. This slide comes from a post hoc analysis of a randomized controlled trial done by Ganesh Konduri and his colleagues, where they showed that early use of surfactant compared to not using surfactant resulted in significant resulted in no difference in outcome in patients with primary pulmonary hypertension or idiopathic PPHN, similar to what we saw with lung recruitment with the oscillator. On the other hand, patients that had perinatal aspiration syndrome, such as meconium aspiration syndrome, pneumonia, sepsis, or other lung diseases, in these conditions, using surfactant early on resulted in a much better outcome compared to not having surfactant. So again, similar to the use of recruitment with high frequency oscillator, use of surfactant in parenchymal lung disease causing PPHN is really beneficial. Earlier this month, Gonzalez and colleagues from Chile present, uh, published a randomized control trial in uh, Journal of Perinatology, where they showed that early use of one or two doses of Curoserve, along with inhaled nitric oxide, resulted in much better drop in oxygenation index and much better outcome compared to babies with PPHN that received inhaled nitric oxide without surfactant alone, further confirming this process.
So how does surfactant work and how do surfactant and inhaled nitric oxide show this synergy in PPHN? Let's assume this to be a patient with asymmetric lung disease. Here you have a collapsed alveolus and here you have an over distended alveolus. In this particular case, the collapsed alveolus shows signs of hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction contributing to high pulmonary vascular resistance. In the over distended alveolus, there is compression of alveolar vessels and that further contributes to increased in pulmonary vascular, pulmonary vascular resistance. In this particular instance, if you administer inhaled nitric oxide, inhaled nitric oxide, as I told you earlier, selectively goes to only to the open alveolus and does not enter the collapsed alveolus. And for that reason, nitric oxide tends to open up these blood vessels with slight improvement in oxygenation, as you can see here with the dotted line in controls receiving nitric oxide. But since this alveolus is over distended, the effect of nitric oxide is compromised because the vessels are compressed because of this over distension. And so the drop in pulmonary vascular resistance is not as good as it should be. On the other hand, if you use surfactant replacement and lung recruitment, all the alveoli are uniformly opened up with homogeneous lung opening. And with that, nitric oxide is more efficiently distributed and reaches its effective area target, which is the pulmonary arterioles and causes uniform pulmonary vasodilation with a decrease in pulmonary vascular resistance and a sustained and marked improvement in oxygenation. So the use of surfactant in any patients with parenchymal lung disease leading on to PPHN is very beneficial. And ideally, in my opinion, it should be done before initiation of inhaled nitric oxide. We also know that there are some patients where there is significant right ventricular dilation and dysfunction, most often seen in cases with congenital diaphragmatic hernia. And in these patients, when the RV dilation is to such a high degree and the afterload for the right ventricle is extremely high, you start seeing significant RV dysfunction. In many of these cases, the ductus starts closing and that further increases and contributes to right ventricular afterload. In these cases, a combination of inhaled nitric oxide, IV mildenone, and IV PGE1 to maintain ductal patency is effective. IV mildenone acts by enhancing the function of the right ventricle. Inhaled nitric oxide acts by reducing the pulmonary vascular resistance, and IV PGE1 opens up the ductus arteriosus, resulting in a pop-off site for reducing right ventricular afterload. And these three drugs act in synergy to improve the function of the right ventricle because a failing right ventricle is one of the common reasons why patients with PPHN require to go on ECMO. So how about the interaction between inhaled nitric oxide and oxygen? Is this marriage one that's made in heaven or one that's made in hell? I hate to sound this way, but it all depends on how much oxygen you have in the environment. That's what dictates how well this marriage will go forward. So let's assume here we have a normal pulmonary artery with an endothelial cell shown in green and a smooth muscle cell shown in brown. We know fully well that the fully coupled endothelial nitric oxide synthase produces nitric oxide, which causes smooth muscle cell relaxation. On the other hand, in PPHN, in some cases where there is a significantly hypertrophied and altered pulmonary artery, in these cases, this remodeled pulmonary artery may have endothelial nitric oxide that's completely uncoupled due to various reasons. And this uncoupled endothelial nitric oxide synthase can be an important source of production of superoxide anions. Superoxide anions and nitric oxide, both are free radicals and they combine with great affinity. And when they combine with each other, create a compound called as peroxynitrate, which induces oxidative stress and is a fairly powerful pulmonary vasoconstrictor. So these three agents, nitric oxide, oxygen, and peroxynitrite are important components that dictate negative pathology resulting in pulmonary vasoconstriction in PPHN. So if, if the nitric oxide is coupled, then it produces nitric oxide. If the ENOS is coupled, it produces nitric oxide. On the other hand, if the ENOS is uncoupled, it produces superoxide anions. And superoxide anions can combine with nitric oxide to produce peroxynitrate, which is really toxic. 
So in vascular biology, these three compounds, nitric oxide, superoxide anions, and peroxynitrate are called as the good, bad, and the ugly. And it's really important while managing PPHN to avoid formation of peroxynitrite in these cells. So what induces formation of superoxide anions? One common thing that we do is ventilating with extremely high concentrations of oxygen. Here is a pulmonary artery from a lamp that received 21% O2 for 30 minutes. Here is a pulmonary artery from a lamp that received 100% O2 for 30 minutes and 30 minutes of ventilation with 100% O2 is adequate to make this pulmonary arterial smooth muscles light up bright with superoxide anions. And the red dye that you see here with DHE is superoxide anions. So a short period of ventilation with hyperoxic concentrations of oxygen is adequate to increase superoxide anions within pulmonary arterial smooth muscle cells. And this superoxide anion can interfere with the function of endogenous nitric oxide. The second thing that we notice in this slide, where you see four slides showing, um, showing uh, peroxynitrate, which is seen here as 3NT in green color. What you see here is that uh, you see a pulmonary artery here really lighted up fairly brightly with peroxynitrate if you use 100% O2. If you use a combination of 100% oxygen and 20 parts per million of inhaled nitric oxide, you see a significant increase in peroxynitrate formation because nitric oxide is interacting with superoxide anions here. If you scavenge all the superoxide anions by using intratracheal recombinant human superoxide dismutase, then this signal is significantly quenched and you see a huge reduction in peroxynitrate formation. Interestingly, just weaning FiO2 to maintain preductal PaO2 in the 50 to 80 millimeters of mercury range while continuing inhaled nitric oxide is also effective in reducing 3 nitrotyrosine formation, thereby showing that weaning inspired oxygen is really, really important while managing babies with PPHN once you achieve adequate PaO2 levels, which in my opinion is something between 50 and 80 millimeters of mercury. We further went on to do some studies where we looked at initial, the effect of initial exposure to oxygen on subsequent relaxation to nitric oxide and acetylcholine. In this particular study, what we did was for around 30 minutes, we exposed these lamps to either 21% O2, 50% O2, or 100% O2 at the time of resuscitation. And subsequently, 90 minutes later, gave them either inhaled nitric oxide or intravenous acetylcholine. What we noted was that Lamps that were initially ventilated with 21% O2 had a much better response, pulmonary vasodilator response to nitric oxide and also to acetylcholine compared to lamps that received 100% O2. This goes to show that initiation of resuscitation with room air, thereby limiting oxygen exposure in these lamps led to better relaxation to inhale nitric oxide later on. So we don't care about what happens in lamps, what happens in babies? Here is an interesting bubble chart where you show the percentage of patients receiving ECMO or with the outcome of combined outcome of ECMO or death on the y-axis and the oxygenation index at the initiation of nitric oxide on the x-axis in various large randomized trials that have been conducted using inhaled nitric oxide. What you see here is that in every single study, when the initial oxygenation index at the time of initiation of nitric oxide was pretty high, the incidence of death or ECMO was high as well. And as we began improvising studies with where we started initial, initiating nitric oxide at lower and lower oxygenation indices, the percentage of patients that suffered from death or ECMO kept on going down. This graph looked pretty good till I came across a couple additional studies from Columbia where they manage patients with gentle ventilation with fairly low PaO2 levels, usually tolerating PaO2 in the 50 millimeters of mercury range. And what we saw in those studies was that even with high oxygenation indices, the incidence of ECMO or death was fairly low with gentle ventilation, as long as you tolerated PaO2 levels in the 50 millimeters of mercury range. So this goes to show that excessive exposure to hyperoxic concentrations of oxygen before initiating nitric oxide can have a detrimental effect and lead to poor outcomes.
So we not only use nitric oxide in term babies, but we are increasingly using it in preterm babies. Here is a graph from the Australia and New Zealand uh, uh, data from 2000 to 2009, where preterm babies less than 28 oh. weeks of gestation were exposed to inhaled nitric oxide quite a bit, almost similar to babies born at greater than 28 weeks of gestation. And we saw a similar, we continue to see a similar pattern between 2008 and 2017. In fact, in 2017, the percentage of babies who received inhaled nitric oxide was pretty high in the 24 to 25 week range as well, similar to what happened in babies at 37 to 30, 44 weeks of gestation. So what's all this exposure to inhaled nitric oxide doing? This is something that we don't know. And the moderator of this, uh, uh, this symposium, Dr. Julie Oi, published some very interesting results where she showed that when you look at babies with inhaled nitric oxide who are exposed to inhaled nitric oxide in the NICUs, when you looked at them, what she observed was that exposure to nitric oxide was a significant risk factor for babies developing subsequent cancer with an adjusted odds ratio of almost 16. And these are the babies that developed, 11 babies that developed um, in cancer in the first five years of follow-up. And uh, Julie can further uh, elaborate on these findings during discussion. So can inhaled NO cause cancer? That's something we don't know. It's possible that there are several things that happen in the NICU, such as phototherapy, radiation, and uh, various other factors that can cause DNA damage resulting in mutagenic changes and malignancies. And so this is something that we need to elaborate further. But this gives us a pause for us to think about for a second before initiating nitric oxide as to whether you're putting your patients at a higher risk for cancer. But we need to figure out that just the environment in the NICU might itself, might itself be a cause for causing malignancies and not just nitric oxide. With that, I will stop and have Steve take over. Thank you, Steve. Great, thank you. I'm gonna see if I could uh, figure out how to share my screen here. So I really, really enjoyed the uh, presentation uh, from uh, Satyan. And uh, as always, he did really a beautiful job. Uh, Satyan's been a, an amazing colleague and collaborator over the years uh, around nitric oxide and many other issues. Um, and uh, I've always been impressed with his skills as a scientist and as a teacher and educator. And you got a flavor of that from his presentation today. And, but I also learned that he's more of a Renaissance man. You know, you can see what a wonderful artist he is. I also learned that he's actually quite the cook. Uh, I know he's on Labor Day cooking his family and I'm sure it was an outstanding meal. And then finally, from, the, from his part of the talk, we learned maybe he's even a marriage counselor, where he's talking about nitric oxide and oxygen, and is that a marriage made in heaven or hell? And so, so truly a Renaissance man, it's a pleasure to share the, uh, the, the, uh, the screen with him today. And uh, I'm still trying to see how I could uh, open up my, uh, my screen here. Um, maybe while I'm doing this, uh, um, Satyan, if you want to take a few questions. Sure, uh, yeah, yeah Satyan, yeah. you've, got, you've got quite a few questions. Uh, Steve, if you just press share screen on the bottom of your uh, Zoom page, that should right. uh, help. So Satyan, you've got uh, quite a few questions. Can you see them on the chat page? Yeah, I can see them. I can start from the top and go from there. Okay, so the first one is from Srini uh, from the Royal, uh, concerned about loading dose of known yeah. in extremely preterm infants. So that's a great question, Srini. That's uh, really true. Um, right now, although the slide that I showed you was a study from um, uh, Patrick McNamara, who had used a loading dose in term infants, not currently both in preterm infants and in term infants, I do not use a loading dose. Typically with a loading dose, especially between 50 and 75 milligram, micrograms per kg, I've noticed a mean drop in systemic arterial pressure of around nine to 10 millimeters of mercury. And that could be really detrimental in some patients with uh, borderline systemic blood pressure. So I do not use uh, a loading dose anymore. Okay, okay. it sounds like um, Steve has worked out 
<laughs> I'll just, just I think so. I hope so. Wanna... Good. Is this, okay. Can everyone see the go... screen okay? Yeah. Yes. So shall we pause the questions and go on to see first? Yes, please. Oh. Okay, Beautiful. good. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you. Well, that background from Satyan was, was wonderful. And it really set the stage for, I think, the, the last part of this discussion. And, and what we wanted to do is talk about nitric oxide in preterm infants, but especially in the context of bronchopulmonary dysplasia. And it gives us an opportunity to discuss the nature of pulmonary hypertension uh, across the, the, the uh, early uh, weeks and months of life. We end up sometimes lumping a lot of these disorders together. When I think of the term persistent pulmonary hypertension of the newborn, I tend to think of the acute events quite quickly after birth that develop. And just as Satyan so nicely outlined about the term infant, certainly the preterm newborn can be just as susceptible for the very same hemodynamic challenges. And so the idea of nitric oxide and what to do about the preterm baby was really nicely addressed in this workshop that Satyan organized and Julie participated in and I was part of as well. And it was this just say no to I know in preterms, really? Um, you know, how can we best understand when pulmonary hypertension is contributing to disease or clinical course? How should we intervene? And how should we begin to understand the different physiologic phenotypes that underlie the pulmonary vascular disease that we see in preterm infants? And as Satyan mentioned already, there certainly is a lot of use of nitric oxide in preterm infants, even though the data are clear that starting low dose nitric oxide in all preterm babies does not change the risk for developing chronic lung disease. And yet, as we will talk about later, none of those large clinical trials incorporated the idea that we're primarily treating pulmonary hypertension. They did not incorporate the use of echocardiograms to identify at-risk infants. And it could be that the phenotype matters, the physiology matters, and perhaps future trials can be studied along those lines. And this is highlighted nicely here from, again, a, a wonderful artistic rendering from, uh, from Satyan, and he shows the different stages of transition in preterm infants and how preterm infants may have early PPHN in which you need rescue treatment. Others you could think about perhaps if we targeted pulmonary vascular disease, perhaps we could still think about preventing BPD, and we'll talk about that as well. And then finally, what about older infants who develop pulmonary hypertension and have problems uh, with uh, um, uh, later issues with BPD and pulmonary hypertension that contributes to morbidity and mortality? Well, when we think about fatal BPD and we think about over 50 years of knowing about BPD from Bill Northway's group, Bill very early on identified pulmonary hypertension as a significant risk factor for developing uh, 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 fatal disease. And as shown here, for example, he said the pathogenesis of corpulnol and BPD is puzzling. Yet in all of his infants who died with BPD, they all had significant cardiomegaly and right ventricular hypertrophy and many of the pulmonary vascular changes that we will see in fatal BPD. As there's been an evolution from the old to the new BPD, we've emphasized the idea that perhaps in the older or more severe forms of BPD, one seeing significant fiber proliferative changes as highlighted in the histology here. Whereas now it remains more of a disease of alveolar simplification, impaired or arrest of distal lung development, in which there's decreased alveoli, decreased septation, and decreased vascular growth. And yet pulmonary hypertension, as shown by the arrow below, can still be a striking feature in many of the infants who have the so-called new BPD. In fact, when we look at a number of our sites who are part of our pediatric pulmonary hypertension network and characterized a registry that we established for, for children that we follow, about half of our cases, surprisingly, were in this group three category that is pulmonary hypertension in association with lung disease. Not simply group one, which is congenital heart disease or idiopathic or other forms, but you can see how large a signal that is in terms of disease being contributed uh, to outcomes of kids. Of that group, about half of them had severe BPD or significant BPD. 
So in other words, this remains a significant problem, even in this era of so-called the new BPD. And this is the slide that highlights part of the problem. There used to be an old mythology that if you're a premature infant and you're born, you don't, may not have enough smooth muscle to develop pulmonary hypertension. And yet we're seeing, and others have reported, dramatic arterial remodeling in some of the vessels as shown here. Here you can see that there's striking fibrointimal proliferation that includes the lumen of the small pulmonary artery. You see smooth muscle thickening and adventitial thickening, making for an obstructive and stiff vessel that really can contribute to a fatal BPD or refractory uh, pulmonary hypertension in these infants. And in fact, these are data from 2007, but these are numbers that really continue today. And that if you have severe pulmonary hypertension, your likelihood of survival is markedly decreased in comparison with those who have milder pulmonary hypertension. But what I especially highlight is most of the deaths occur within the first several months after birth. So if we could better understand the different forms of pulmonary vascular disease early in this window, perhaps target individualized strategies for therapy and care, perhaps we could improve outcomes for this overall group. So as we think about the pulmonary vascular phenotypes, and this is very much like Satyan's uh, artistic rendering, I think about three different phases of disease. First is the early, the first two weeks of life. Very much like the term infant with PPHN, we know that PPHN syndrome, where you have hypoxemic respiratory failure with right to left shunt, can occur in preterms as well. There's something known as delayed pulmonary vascular transition where they may not have severe right to left shunting or exclusive shunting, but there's a slow transition of relatively high pulmonary artery pressures that likely have clinical meaning. And we'll talk about that briefly as well. And then finally, the idea that's mostly been research oriented and that is early pulmonary vascular disease may be a biomarker for subsequent risk of BPD or late pulmonary hypertension or poor respiratory outcomes. So these are all different, you know, uh, gray areas of what it means to have an abnormal echocardiogram early after birth. Now, of course, when we think about BD, BPD, it's usually in the evolving or established phase, weeks to months of age. You have sustained high levels of respiratory support. You may have recurrent cyanotic episodes. Perhaps there's pulmonary hypertension after NICU discharge. We certainly have some infants who will appear later in infancy who apparently made it out of the NICU without significant signs of pulmonary hypertension at that time. And then finally, another fascinating category we will not get into today, but the idea that you can have persistent echo abnormalities during childhood after preterm birth and lead to exercise intolerance children, and more strikingly, perhaps, a significant early pulmonary hypertension uh, that can occur in young adults. And, uh, and so abnormal structure of the heart and function in adults clearly is something we have to be concerned about, or the role of cardiovascular or pulmonary vascular disease across the lifespan is something we should learn more about. And as I mentioned before, this is a real wonderful uh, work uh, from Buffalo that showed that pulmonary vascular remodeling in preterm infants with severe respiratory failure is not uncommonly associated with vascular remodeling. And in fact, if one looks at fatal disease, the wall thickness of the vessels is shown on the right, correlated with respiratory severity score. So indeed, there are early changes in the vasculature that may incur in utero, develop rapidly after birth or not resolve, that really uh, affect early outcome. And in fact, if one looks at studies, this is from Japan where they, and, and Orlando, uh, Dr. Mirza, if you look at the rates of PPHN for term and near-term infants, about between one and two per thousand births, perhaps in the late preterm, it's more of 5.4 per thousand births, but in lower gestational age newborns, 8% of infants below 28 weeks, and that it's clearly related to severity of prematurity. 4% at 27 weeks, 18% at 23 to 24 weeks. And this slower transition may be simply a marker of the relative lung immaturity and difficulty with the transition from a respiratory standpoint, but it also suggests there may be a pulmonary vascular contribution as well. And certainly uh, Dr. Mirza has shown this kind of association 
of the significant delay in transition, meaning the delay in the drop of pulmonary artery pressure after birth, being uh, inversely correlated with maturation as shown here. And indeed, as he's looked at these kids over time, this delayed transition was associated with lower birth weight and just age, higher risk for death, and BPD as significant problems. Well, just to reiterate what Satyano taught us about the term infant in this previous part of this lecture, certainly the uh, effects of inhaled NO acutely can be quite striking, especially in preterm infants with severe respiratory and cytohydramnios of problems. And if you look at, this is from Finland, but many sites have a similar exposure, showing that the arterial alveolar ratio is shown here markedly increases with initiation of nitric oxide as readily in preterm infants as one could see in the term infant. The caveat being the same as what Satyan mentioned of the term, first we try to uh, uh, improve uh, lung uh, FRC and lung recruitment. We like to ventilate them safely, but to improve gas exchange as best as we can. And then if we're faced with persistent echocardiographic signs of PPHN, we believe that perhaps they're still good candidates for receiving nitric oxide. And this was stated several years ago uh, with members of the PPHNet, the American Heart Association, and the American Thoracic Society. Now, we don't have striking data that proves this, but a very intriguing study was done in a retrospective study based on um, electronic health records or medical records, um, which look at diagnostic codes. And if you look at the B panel first of neonates who had pulmonary hypoplasia without PPHN physiology, when one gave nitric oxide, there was absolutely no difference in survival here. Yet if one looks at those infants with pulmonary hypoplasia, again, preterm infants, who had PPHN as one of their diagnoses, one could see almost a 30% increase in survival. And this was not uh, significantly significant because the statistically significant because the numbers were quite small. And yet it's a very intriguing finding that indeed, if we can better classify or phenotype our premature infants, perhaps interventions could be more successful. I'd like to mention what are the risks of pulmonary hypertension and BPD. And certainly this wonderful review highlights a few features. That is birth weight and gestational age, being small for gestational age and oligohydramnios. All of these speak to antenatal origins of pulmonary vascular disease that may lead to undergrowth of the lung circulation or changes in the physiology of the vasculature, which may contribute to the risk of developing BPD later. And this is a schematic that highlights this concept that maternal stress and antenatal stress related to preeclampsia, uh, placental insufficiency for many causes may disrupt vascular growth. And our interest is the lung, so perhaps it decreases angiogenesis in the core blood, the fetal exposure before birth, and then it leads to some of the sequelae of decreased vascular and alveolar growth beyond vasodilation or vasoconstriction that may reduce surface area, impair gas exchange, and that sets the stage for chronic lung disease, including late pulmonary hypertension. Clinically, we think this is true for some uh, studies we've done in a prospective cohort, where we found that if you did echoes in all comers who are prematurely born, the presence of septal flattening on day seven of life was strongly associated with BPD severity at 36 weeks. And that septal flattening and RV dilation were important markers, as you even thought about how they did during infancy with their chronic lung disease. We saw that there was more in the way of uh, respiratory ER visits, hospital admissions, other kinds of problems. If you had pulmonary vascular disease, that's what PVD is at seven days. And especially if you're on a ventilator still at seven days, the combination, in other words, helped predict who is gonna develop pulmonary hypertension. Well, as I mentioned before, early deaths with the pulmonary hypertension occur and we have a narrow window of intervention that we have to better understand. And something that shows this association is reflected here. Prospective studies showing that if you have early pulmonary hypertension, you had worse pulmonary complications and outcomes as highlighted here. 
And indeed, if one did some simple things without nitric oxide even perhaps, for example, how we target oxygen saturations or how we think about atrial septal defects and close them earlier perhaps, we could obviate the risk for pulmonary hypertension. Here we see a nice study which was really intriguing in the sense that if you looked at the um, higher saturation group in the orange or pink group here, one saw a reduced risk for pulmonary hypertension than those infants who were targeted at lower saturations during this window as well. And then finally, ASD is strongly associated with it. And it suggests that short of pulmonary hypertensive medications, how we manage saturations, how we manage the ventilator, how we manage their shunts may actually be something that's really substantially important in impacting improving late outcomes in our kids. Well, what about severe or established BPD? And I'll just spend a couple minutes here. We know that it's related to the severity of disease here. And again, before we think about nitric oxide as a therapy in this setting, we have to consider heart vascular and lung interactions. And so one therapeutically would think about, what about the lung disease? Are we hyperinflated? Do we have regional atelectasis? Are we hypoxemic or hypercarbic? What about the heart? We heard about RV dysfunction and about LV diastolic dysfunction and shunts, but these can all affect pulmonary artery pressure. And none of these really would demand the need to start a pulmonary hypertension medication until we first got a handle on both the lung disease and the heart disease before coming to the pulmonary vascular component. This is an example. We heard about gentle ventilation and why the rationale is important. When we're talking about a baby with evolving or established BPD, you could see from the CT scan how heterogeneous these lung regions are. In other words, you see the areas of relative hyperinflation, hyper relative areas of poor recruitment, neither atelectasis, fibrosis, or edema. So it's not one size fits all. And strategies that may affect in the setting of acute respiratory failure with lower tidal volumes and short inspiratory times and rapid rates may actually lead to over distension of these regions of lung that are already highly compliant and have low resistance with little gas distribution with the remaining of the lung. So the idea here is that we gave slower, bigger breaths at very slow rates. Different strategy, larger tidal volumes, but different strategy from gentle ventilation, we could more successfully maintain and sustain these kids. And treat their pulmonary hypertension is a very important step. Here's one example of a baby Low tidal volume, six mils per kilo, PEEP of 14, I time very short of 0.4 for a very rapid rate of 36 breaths per minute. And we have regional atelectasis, very hyperflated. Simply, I dropped the rate from 36 per minute. We didn't have the PEEP, the I time was slightly increased, a little bit of breath. You could see that atelectatic region readily opened up. This is after weeks and weeks of being in 100% oxygen could drop the FI2 to 65% and lower. And I show this because what you do with the lung, what you do with cardiac management, makes a big difference before we get to the stage of pulmonary hypertensive medications. So there are a few different pathways. We won't have time to get into too much detail, but certainly the idea that uh, nitric oxide and cyclic GMP might be helpful for BPD has been shown. Old work from Roberta Ballard's group shows improved oxygenation with severe BPD. In the cath lab, we show very nice responses to nitric oxide, well beyond that seen with a calcium channel blocker. Certainly extending this chronically with the cyclic GMP agonist of sildenafil was successful. And there are now a number of choices and things that are breaking that will soon be available with further study and are being introduced cautiously into the neonatal setting. So overall, then, we still have this incredible challenge of how to improve this early mortality. And this is a paper from, from the uh, Netherlands group, Ralph Berger's group, showing again the same uh, high mortality in infants with pulmonary hypertension early within the first year after diagnosis. And yet those who respond early and survive over time, we can successfully most often get them off medication with good apparent resolution of their pulmonary hypertension.
So all the more reason to be more aggressive, more attentive with our diagnostics, and perhaps learning more about successful interventions. So to conclude that early pulmonary vascular disease contributes to the pathogenesis of BPD and BPD-associated pulmonary hypertension, we require rigorous evaluation and treatment of underlying lung disease, and the management is not all the same for each of these babies. Time-dependent, disease-dependent, and must match the underlying physiology. Ventilator strategies that, that provide chronic respiratory support may improve outcomes of severe kids. And then finally, we have to watch for cardiovascular abnormalities that can modulate the outcome, such as pulmonary vein stenosis or left ventricular dysfunction. And so thank you very much uh, for your time, and uh, I'd, we'd be open for uh, further questions. That's amazing, Steve. Thank you so much. Um, Okay, so we've got about 10 billion questions on the chat line. Uh, I know our team has got to go and do their rounds, and um, but uh, we shall keep talking for a few more minutes, if that's okay with everyone. You, you guys okay? Yes. Steve and Satya? Yep, okay. Thank you. That, that presentation was like gold. Um, I think it'll be circulating a lot and uh, very much valued by everyone. Lots of exciting information. So um, Satyan has um, addressed the million known questions from Srini and Kurt the Wall from Newcastle has asked about um, should an ultrasound be done to assess LV function and pulmonary blood flow before starting INO? Well, that would be ideal, but in real world situation, especially in areas where there is no targeted, endo targeted neonatal echocardiography, it might be quite challenging, but uh, if there is access to echo, it will always be good to assess hemodynamics before initiating inhaled nitric oxide. Yeah, I agree completely with that. And that's why I'm really excited about this whole movement to have uh, functional or bedside echoes that neonatologists learn to perform. And, and even if one just simply looks at right to left shunting at the ductal level and at the atrial level, and you get a sense that clinically, there's high pressure causing some of the hypoxemia that really helps quite a bit. But I think using bedside tools, we always say at two in the morning, what do you do when you have a sick baby? And I don't think that every baby, simply because they're hypoxemic, should be trialed on nitric oxide. But I do think that if there's clinical evidence, you see some splitting of pre and post ductal saturations. You're able to get an echo uh, if you're fortunate enough to, to have that available, or if you could incorporate that into your NICU practice, it would be terrific. But then to be as cautious for the reasons that Satchan so nicely highlighted. If you have a failing left ventricle, a stiff left ventricle, if you have a hypoplastic left heart, if you have reasons uh, that are contributing to some of the problems clinically, nitric oxide could be problematic. So, so you should start it empirically, watch for the response closely, but not all babies who are hypoxemic, who are prematurely born, deserve or need to get nitric oxide. Okay, um, I, I would let you guys choose the questions because um, we could be here for three hours or something <laughs> at least. <laughs> so, um, are, are you able to see the chat questions? Yes. Um, yeah, so Satya, on which one should we take? <laughs> okay, well, why don't I guide you guys? Uh, how long what? do you uh, Got it. part a million? Your yeah, Sam in Singapore. How do you keep? Um, how long would you keep a child on twenty parts per million if they don't respond? Well, that's a good question. So, in term infants, if you have already optimized lung ventilation, you have recruited the lung, and the hemodynamics are not compromised, if there is no response to twenty parts per million of inhaled nitric oxide, I usually stop after sixty minutes. Uh, I feel that. Continuing NO when there is no response after optimizing ventilation and hemodynamics. Uh, if you don't get a response, I think it's time to stop. But in majority of the instances, I've noticed that poor lung recruitment is the number one reason for failure to respond to nitric oxide. And for that reason, once you recruit the lung, especially with surfactant and occasionally an oscillator or a high frequency jet ventilator, you do get a better response. 
Steve? Yeah, I would, I would concur with Sachan completely, but I, I would say it's not just the oscillation of surfactant, but even the, the conventional ventilator strategies and very, very early on our experience, for example, you know, I'll give an example of meconium aspiration baby, where we would go faster and faster and faster on a ventilator, then, ran, then switch over to uh, nitric oxide, no response, take off the nitric at oscillation, no response. And then we would then simply say, well, now wait a minute, this is a mixed disease with airways disease and some heterogeneity of their, even if it's acute respiratory failure. So again, a slower response, slower rate, a little bit more tidal volume. And then adding the nitric oxide, it'd be a home run response. So in other words, a poor responder, it's always relative. And I always find the non-responder far more interesting than the responder because it challenges us. Yeah. And so, this, and we've seen this with CDH as well. You know, no response to nitric and yet how you change your ventilator strategy and then restart it or supporting cardio, cardiac performance and then re-challenging. So I think thinking about the three spheres is what we always do at the bedside, heart, lung, and then finally vascular. And using the x-ray to then gauge what we're doing as our ventilator strategy. And, uh, and I think to me, that's where you could really uh, convert some of your non-responders to responders before simply having a deadline of 20 minutes on, no good, let's stop. And so I think that's, that's um, more of an algorithmic decision rather than the physiologic strategy what that individualized baby needs for care. Thank you. So there are lots of questions on the chat pane. Uh, so I might um, send you guys the email, uh, an email with these questions when you have time, maybe answer and I'll post them back up again. Uh, but what I took home from that was the use of surfactant and uh, a very scary peak level, 14. Um, that will probably uh, freak most of us out, I think. And that's certainly Absolutely. more for Malaysia. I said, any advice for someone who is still peat phobic? Yeah, so, so, so peat, it doesn't, it's not like a light switch. We don't say one day you don't have BPD, one day you do have BPD and you hit a light switch and boom, you got to go up to 14. We just, it's a stepwise progression as one uses rapid rate, slow tidal volume, monitor the pressures very carefully and the volumes very carefully, absolutely starting off that way. But in babies who still show ventilator dependency, or in their x-ray they start showing early signs of regional or patchy areas of atelectasis. That's where making some of these early changes, not from 2 to 14 for PEEP, and not from 6 to 12 mil per kilo tidal volume, more over time. But do it incrementally and gently, but progressively, and reassess where you're at. And for us, if you take the severe BPD, we found that this simple ventilator strategy dramatically changed survival at our own center. And we used to say these babies had feudal lung disease and withdraw support. And it was those very ethical discussions that stimulated the development of our BPD team about 15 years ago in Colorado. Now, now many gentle strategies where you need to go is something that's progressive with them. but certainly if you have established severe BPD who's you know uh, later uh, corrected age towards term you know here's where we really begin to think about the idea that uh, these these are the ways we would do it we would start by dropping the rate so you're not gas trapping selectively and if you don't drop the rate and you do these changes, it's going to be harmful. If you don't have enough time to exhale, the larger tidal volumes and more PEEP will just create a cycle of worsening ventilator patient asynchrony, worsening hypercapnia. But if you keep keeping dialing up the rate, you're causing more harm. You're increasing intrinsic PEEP, you're increasing gas trapping. So that was the first thing to teach that Took us a long time as a team and now we do routinely as babies is we drop the rate and stepwise begin to increase our tidal volume gently increase our peep and our goals aren't to normalize pco2 but we want to start seeing the fio2 coming down we want to see an x-ray where those atelectatic regions begin to open up anyway i could talk for hours on this kind of stuff but but it's not black and white there is a gray zone and uh, those Pressures may be scary, but you do it incrementally and get there. And they end up being pretty common with the more severe extreme 
invasive ventilator dependent babies around 36 to 40 weeks. Mm. Oh my goodness. Okay, thank you. So we probably need like a whole day on nitric oxide and <laughs> ventilation. Um, and i um, really grateful for both of you for um, this amazing, amazing presentation. So much to learn from this. And hopefully we can get together again. Um, if it's okay with both of you, I'd like to post the uh, talk on the chat groups, if that's okay, and our, our web page. Um, and possibly, if you have time, um, answer the email quest the, the chat questions. There are just questions just come flying in left, right, and center. It'll take you another like six hours to answer, I'm sure. <laughs> um, so once again, thank you very much, and hopefully we can meet again soon in a real pass, not a virtual pass. Um, and maybe go ski in Colorado or something. Absolutely, and, yes. yes. And fight the bushfires in uh, California, Satyan. Good luck with them. Thank you. I really enjoyed your talks to you. Very informative. Thank and you Satyan, so much. And likewise. Thank Love you. the toilet. Love the toilet. <laughs> I finally <laughs> understand that. I finally understand that. <laughs> thank you, Steve. Thank you, Julie. Okay, uh, thanks, really. everybody. Okay, bye. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Okay, bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.